Sunday afternoon to you. It is a great Sunday afternoon to be inside and learn about our history. I'm Jim Ogle, the Executive Director of Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area, and welcome to today's continuing program on the various sites and the stories of the Underground Railroad here in Freedom's Frontier. Today we have a special treat, a showing of the Underground Railroad film, Dawn of the Day, with commentary by its writer and director. But before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items for you. As you watch this film, you may find that a question comes to mind. There are two ways to ask those questions. The first is to click on the question and answer button, usually at the bottom of the screen, and type in your question. I'll be happy to add those to our discussion. You can also ask a question on your own. To do so, you click the raise your hand feature in the webinar controls at the bottom of your screen. I'll call on you and open up both your audio and video if you turn on your camera and you can ask your question directly. So as the mood strikes you, please feel free to ask a question. Now let me just take a moment to share with you some information about Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area. We're so excited to be participating and sharing with you about the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom sites that exist in Freedom's Frontier. Right now, there are a total of 22. Now, part of the reason we're excited is our mission is to tell the stories of the struggles for freedom in our region and their lasting impact on our nation. Now, the three stories we tell are the Missouri-Kansas border war, the settling of the frontier, and the enduring struggle for freedom. Now we cover an area of 29 counties in Kansas, 12 in Missouri, a total of 41 counties that are about the size of the state of South Carolina and have 3 million residents. We utilize this map to help share about those sites in Freedom's Frontier, but we've added new tools along the way partly in honor of underground, the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. I wanna share with you just a little bit about our new Freedom's Frontier app and why it is such an important tool to help share the story with you. Sometimes the most important stories aren't widely told. Sometimes what matters the most remains a secret, even if it's right in front of us. There's a place that defined the history of our nation, where patriots fighting for freedom gained victories that lasted through the years to secure equal freedoms for all Americans. We're talking about the Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area. If you didn't know you had such a place around you, the FFNHA app is for you. You'll discover important historic sites and museums all connected to tell the remarkable stories that shaped our nation. The settlement of the frontier, the border war and civil war, and the enduring struggle for freedom. Thanks to our easy to use app, you'll find tours and amazing places to visit that bring the region together and make it come alive. Visit the App Store or the Google Play Store, download the FFNHA app, and discover the stories that changed a nation Enjoy the ride. History awaits. Now, we've created a special Underground Railroad Network to Freedom tour on the Freedom's Frontier app. It allows you to discover all of the sites that are visible that are on the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. And it gives you background not only on the Network to Freedom, but also the individual sites. And one of the unique attributes of the app is your ability to collect a digital National Park Service Underground Railroad Network to Freedom stamp, just as many of you connect the phys or collect the physical stamps in your passport for the National Park Service. We hope you'll be able to collect all of these stamps from throughout the Freedom's Frontier area, including 
visiting sites like the Mount Mitchell Heritage Prairie. This is how you can discover the app in the App Store and the Google Play Store along the way. Now, as part of the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom, we're excited that we are one of the largest collections of sites in the state of Kansas with 21 sites. While there are many sites and many people think about the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom only in the context of the farther east coast we are, here in the Midwest, we have important sites that tell a very important story along the way. And of course, one of those sites, as I mentioned, is the Mount Mitchell Heritage Prairie. Now, we're very excited that the state of Kansas and Travel Kansas, the tourism office for the state, has gotten involved in this process along the way. And I want to share with you a video they put together to talk about the importance of the Underground Railroad in Kansas. Unfortunately, that video isn't available right now. My apologies. So we're very excited that uh, we have two people joining us for today's program that I think will be very, very interesting for you to interact with. Um, the first of them is Michael Stubbs, who uh, is a longtime partner with Freedom's Frontier and of course the director of the pro uh, program. And I want to first introduce Michael, so he might introduce Rusty Earl. Michael, will you take it away? Hi, Jim. Good to be with you today. Well, uh, Rusty is a friend that I've known for oh, the last five or six years. Uh, he is a producer director with the College of Education at Kansas State. They produce educational materials that are used throughout the state. Um, he's done a lot of wonderful projects, one of them being Dawn of Day. Uh, recently, he did a, sh a program which he might mention, give himself a plug, uh, about immigrants in Kansas. Uh, so I'm happy to present Rusty Earl. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jim, for having me. Um, so I guess we're going to do kind of a brief introduction on the film then. Um, this was an interesting journey getting involved with. Uh, about six years ago, maybe seven years ago, I had run into a gentleman named Richard Pitts, who is the main narrator of the film. And I had been on a tour with him and some of our Kansas State University students to uh, explore Mount Mitchell, which is just in our backyard here in Wamego, and to kind of talk about some of the history that he had come across. And he and Michael have known each other for years before that time as well. And so part of getting to know Richard was his, his passion and his desire that children in Kansas understand some of the living history that happened right here in our backyard. And so we sat down on a number of conversations to talk about creating some type of a documentary that could specifically be made for students in K through 12 schools here in Kansas that could address not only the historical side of things, but the personal uh, backstories of some of these uh, characters, uh, the abolitionists, um, from what we know, what little we know of as far as the enslaved people that had been uh, transported here. And so over time, we met with Michael Stubbs and some others. We came across the wonderful uh, historian uh, right here in Wamego named Madge McDonald. And so we put together this idea of five or six possible stories that we could put together in a documentary, which became Dawn of Day, um, stories from the Underground Railroad. And so as part of that, we spent about six months of research. And then as we began producing different parts of the story, we would come across more and more history. And so this is one of those few pieces where we say we helped to write it, but the reality was this was a, a documentary about discovery. And so along the way, as you'll see, Richard is actually playing the role of a narrator who is interviewing people along the way. 
And uh, it's just been kind of a tremendous um, uh, experience seeing this grow. Um, sadly, Richard Pitts passed away just this last year uh, from cancer. And, uh, you know, he was someone that made a tremendous impact in children's lives. And as you see his own personal story near the end of the film, you'll see why he was able to make such a strong connection to the Underground Railroad. So um, since this film has come out, we put it on uh, YouTube after a successful run here locally on local PBS. Uh, it came out in 2016. And this year with a lot of things happening in the world, the, the, the traction that's got online was much bigger than we anticipated. So as of right now, it's been seen somewhere around 1.3 million times on YouTube and every day the traction just keeps on growing. Um, it has around 10,000 views a day on average. And so we see that as a testament to Richard's work and to everyone that was involved in this. So I think that's all I can share with you now, Jim, but uh, thank you everyone for being here and watching and I look forward to hearing your questions. It's a story that can't be forgot because there's so much injustice. There's so much hatred. And it's something that we can't ever allow to happen again in our country and in the greater sense in the whole world. The best way that we can fight ignorance is to educate. And so kids need to know this story about human injustice, about doing what is right, about going and believing in something to the point where you take action on it. Every day across the United States, school children recite the Pledge of Allegiance. The last sentence states, with liberty and justice for all. That liberty and justice came at a price. In America, between 1607 and 1865, African Americans didn't have their freedom. During this time period, they fought to be free. However, their story has often been excluded from the American experience. Why? Because most of their stories come from the oral tradition. And until the Civil Rights era, their story wasn't considered important. African Americans, Native Americans, and Euro Americans worked together here in Kansas between 1854 and 1861 to make Kansas a free state. They established the western edge of the Underground Railroad in this country which started the long journey to liberty and justice for all. Just north of the town of Obunsi stands a marker in honor of the diverse, brave men and women who traveled to that area. The sign reads, an Astra per Espira, which means, a rough road leads to the stars. That monument has more meaning than most people know. The journey to freedom was unlike the highway tolls that you and I pay today. Braving the Underground Railroad guaranteed exhaustion, mental, physical, and psychological. Thousands tried to pay the toll for freedom. Only a few made it 
and the ones that didn't were sent back to the farms they tried to escape from. It is estimated that between 20,000 and 30,000 slaves were held along the western border of Missouri, with over 115,000 statewide. Although most slaveholders have fewer than 10 slaves, the work that was required of them was every bit as grueling as those on larger plantations in the South. Still, due to their smaller size, it gave opportunity for slaves to look beyond their master's farms and to establish connections on other farms that would enable some of them to escape. In researching the history of the Underground Railroad throughout the United States, many of the stories we hear about describe individuals and families leading small parties of slaves from one way station to the next, acting as conductors and of individual station masters, those that provided safe houses where slaves could stay for a short time. In nearly all cases, they were headed north to the free states with routes leading as far north as Canada. Somewhat unique to Kansas is the recorded story about organized trains that transported larger groups of slaves from one location for many miles, usually to a safe house before making their homework journey. After these trains had been established, it gave room for station masters to do short runs from one house to another, with rest stations in between. In 1860, Charles Leon Hart a Polish-American and committed abolitionist journeyed with a group of like-minded men and approximately 15 slaves on one of the last trains of the Underground Railroad in Kansas. Reverend John Stewart was their appointed leader. They traveled an incredible distance of approximately 300 miles from Lawrence, Kansas to Iowa City, Iowa. They traveled a rough, northwesterly route to avoid the more popular lane trail that was being watched by slave catchers and pro-slavery sympathizers. Traveling in a train of four to five horse-drawn wagons, they transported men, women, children, and infants. The road was not easy and often meant staying only a day or two ahead of masters and slave catchers. There were close calls and heated warnings from friends along the way. Charles recorded their two-month journey from Lawrence southwest through the Wakarusa Range to Auburn, Harveyville, Wabuncie, across the Carr River, north of Manhattan, Centralia, on up into Nebraska, east of the Missouri River, to their eventual destination in Iowa City. In what is one of the most detailed accounts on record, they not only escaped slave catchers and pro-slavery sympathizers, but they trailblazed the furthest western loop of the Underground Railroad at the time. Charles recorded the names of some individuals, including descriptions of them in a few of their conversations. Names like Black Hawk, Black Jack, Nancy, Kate, My George, Johnny, Joe, and Ned. Food was always scarce, and fresh clothes and bedding were much appreciated. Help that came was not always from the source one would expect. Several different religious denominations and fellowships were organized to come to their aid, often providing news of followers that were all too eager to catch up with them. It becomes clear, reading Leon Hart's journal, that there was a wide variety of opinions and positions that people had about slavery. Yet through it all, people of all faiths and political backgrounds united to make their passageway safe. Once they arrived to Iowa City, some of the freed slaves settled. Others were transported further north or back east to Boston. It's interesting to note that many of these freedmen were willing to go to war and join the Union Army in the years to come. In order for the Underground Railroad to be successful, you had to rely on way stations and relations of old friends to make it from point to point.
In order to understand the Underground Railroad in Kansas prior to 1861, it's important to know who some of those key players were and their perspectives. Well, the, the first group that we need to think, of course, the abolitionists, the people that came to Kansas with the express purpose of stopping the spread of slavery. And we're talking about people from the New England states, um, usually driven here on a religious basis. You have John Brown, who is from back east. He is inspired by, you don't want to call it fanaticism, but it's religious zeal. And he's going to come to Kansas and he's going to do everything that he can with he and his sons to eliminate the scourge of slavery from the Great Plains. He kind of matched the, the, the pace and tempo and, and the fever of the Missouri ruffians? Oh, absolutely, if not exceeding it. I mean, and he's memorialized there in the Capitol John Stuart Curry's great mural of him holding the rifle in one hand, the Bible in the other, and those piercing eyes. I mean, it's just amazing to look at this character in history. They want to stop slavery. Kansas is the hotbed for it. It's going to be up for popular sovereignty. We got border ruffians, mm -hmm. people that cross the border from Missouri. They're going to vote several times or try to vote several times when the elections come up. And, you know, one of the other things they try and do is intimidate people, make sure they don't vote, because they see Kansas as an agricultural hotbed. Mm. It's a place where slavery can expand. Yeah. You got border ruffians like William Quantrill, who leads the raid into Lawrence. Today, we'd call it a terrorist attack. Massacre. I mean, they go in, they murder males randomly in the streets and it, it depicts a time that's just hard for us to fathom today. Well, tell me a little bit about the two major compromises and how that affected Kansas, Kansans at that particular time in the 1850s before it was a state. Well, you, you know, I think back to Shelby Foote, uh -huh. who was one of the best Civil War narrative writers of all time. And he said, you know, the one thing about Americans is we tend to think of ourselves as uncompromising. Yeah. And yet it's these two compromises, the Compromise of 1820, the Compromise of 1850, that really set the stage for what becomes Bleeding Kansas. So talk to me a little bit about this term that we hear called Bleeding Kansas. Bleeding Kansas is a term that Horace Greeley used. He was the editor of the New York Times at the time, and he was also a fervent abolitionist. And it's a time where media sensationalism exists. It's also a time where editors like Horace Greeley impact the country. Mm -hmm. uh, later, we have the headline on the New York Tribune, Head West, young man. I mean, Greeley was this influential literary figure. He speaks out about slavery, and he sees bleeding Kansas as a insightful term, a way to ignite the passions of the people of the country. Greeley saw this as an opportunity to use that as a bit of propaganda to promote what's happening in Kansas as kind of a microcosm of the whole country, and the fact that it's going to bring about the Civil War, or at least the abolition of slavery, which was his goal. The South, they want to keep the balance in the Senate, uh -huh. and they need to have some sort of concession to make the Compromise of 1850 work. So they allow slave trade to occur in certain parts, uh, it's still allowed in the capital. Politically speaking, the Compromise of 1850 is doomed to fail, yeah. and that's where we get the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The Kansas-Nebraska Act allows popular sovereignty to determine yeah what's going to happen in the new territories coming out. And so you have this political battlefield that's going to be Kansas. Mm -hmm. Will it be a free state? Will it be a slave state? That's where you have the people from New England coming in. You have the border ruffians coming across from Missouri to try and make Kansas a slave state. And it essentially is the first piece of tender 
to ignite the powder keg that will be the Civil War. Amongst all this turmoil here in Kansas, yet and still, African Americans sought to come here to escape. Why? You got the Fugitive Slave Act that's enacted, and, and it's literally a felony to aid and abet a slave yeah. or to even house a, a slave in the North. And so while there's still traffic on the Underground Railroad heading up through the North and the Eastern states, Kansas becomes kind of a desirable route, this spur that can circumvent some of the hot spots where there are raiding parties waiting for slaves to come north. And so Kansas becomes uh, the spur of the railroad as a way to try and get slaves to the freedom of the north and Canada. Talk to me from a teacher's perspective. Why should kids want to know about the, this history in Kansas? It's kind of funny. Clear up to the 1940s, 1950s, Kansas is a political hotbed. The acts of William Allen White as a newspaper editor was big. Dwight D. Eisenhower comes from here. He's the president in the 1950s. And Kansas was a good barometer of what was occurring in, in the state. You ask kids today, is, is Kansas important? Well, we're just a bunch of farmers. No, I mean, there, there was so much history to it yeah. and such powerful stories. And you catch that in a story about what is right, what is justice, what does this country mean? And it's a powerful story. There's heroes, there's villains and it can just draw you in. But you know, the biggest thing, it starts the Civil War. And it's really what makes the United States, the United States. Prior to the Civil War, if you ask someone from Richmond, Virginia, who are you? Well, I'm a Virginian. It's after the Civil War that that same person would say, well, I'm an American. Here in Kansas is the start of the modern United States, in my opinion. Whoa. <laughs> I can picture a room full of people dancing. I know. I think that too. Yeah. Long dresses and yep. yeah. And I hear that you have a connection to the Underground Railroad here in Kansas. I do. My great great grandfather was a station master on the Underground Railroad. My great-grandfather was a conductor. Joshua Smith was the, uh, the older man, and John was his son. Joshua and his wife and a baby came from England. And they went to Utica, New York, then Lawrence, and then came out looking for land and found land just west of the uh, Indian reservation, which was huge in those days. And what was his motivation to come? He was looking for land. He was an orchardist in England. Oh. And he was looking for land and found it and then went back and got his family. And, and then he was here probably a year or so before the colony came from New Haven. And then he got very involved, obviously, in the sure. Underground Railroad. Why do you think they called it the Underground Railroad? You know, I have heard, and a, a story that somebody said is probably true, but I don't know that, that a master was chasing his slave, and he said he just disappeared. It was like he went underground. <laughs> I know that was at times, places, sure. but, um, and then the, since they called it the Underground Railroad, then they used railroad terms for station master and conductor and such. So tell me what a station master and conductor of the Underground Railroad is. Station master housed the slaves, and conductor obviously conducted them to a safe place. However, I found out that my great-great-grandfather conducted them clear to Nebraska. Okay. It was very secretive, it had to be, of course, and 
My grandfather told the story, his dad had told him, that they would come in the middle of the night with the wagon and they just said, let's go. And the, the kids didn't know anything about it. They couldn't have. You know, if any of the children had known about sure. what was going on and had mentioned it to a friend, absolutely, they would have all been in trouble, so. So, do you have any idea where they hid the uh, fugitives? In the loft of the house. And Joshua's house was right across the road and down about a block from the Mitchell house. And they were very good friends. Do you think there were ever any close calls? Oh, I'm sure there were. I'm sure there were. I have one of the things that my aunt wrote down was that one of my great, great aunts, someone came to the house and said there are catchers or something. The, the people who were chasing the slaves in the area and to be very careful. And she said, I have a um, big bucket of hot water on the stove to throw on them. <laughs> so they, they must have known. Sure. But uh, that would have, she would have been an adult by that time. What do you think would have happened if your great-grandfather great gotten caught? Well, he went back to Lawrence to get his family mm -hmm. and was accosted on the way back by border ruffians. And he said that he thought the only thing that saved his life was his prematurely gray hair and his English accent. He convinced them he didn't know anything about it. <laughs> but if they'd have thought he had anything to do with it, they would have hugged him on the spot. Oh, I believe it too. And that's why I was so amazed when I found out that he took slaves with a wagon mm -hmm. to the Nebraska line. And I think, boy, that man had to be very brave and very committed. What do you think was one of the determining factors that pushed him to the anti-slavery side? I'd like to think that he thought it was just a very important thing to do. And I think I'd probably be right because of what he did. Mm -hmm. He must have thought it was, it was the right thing to do. During the 1850s, Kansas was a territory governed by local law enforcement and militias. During that time, emphasis was made on the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, virtually making it impossible for anyone to remain neutral. So this was built uh, sometime after the Civil War when the economy recovered. You know, there was the big drought of 1860, so nothing happened then. And this, this door used to open inward, but it's a great old building. Share with me a little bit about the role the Wabunsee Colony um, played with the Underground Railroad here in Kansas. The Beecher Colony came in 1856 in the spring. And before they came out here, they were greeted in Lawrence by the Free State leaders. And they pledged their allegiance that if Lawrence ever needed them to come, they would come and help. So when they got here, it was just a matter of weeks before they were called and they formed a militia called the Prairie Guards. And the people in the Prairie Guards were very knowledgeable of each other. And the Underground Railroad started a year later when the families, the women and children had come by 1857 because the violence had subsided along the Kansas River. And since they had formed all these alliances during the height of the clashes. Then when it came time to help enslaved Africans seeking their freedom, everybody knew each other already. So somebody in Harveyville would help someone coming from up the Wakarusa, and then they'd go from Harveyville to straight here sometimes, sometimes through Mission Creek. But all the people helping knew each other. Oftentimes, some of the kids uh, didn't know what the parents were doing as far as their Underground Railroad uh, endeavors. Uh, do you think that was the case with Captain Mitchell and some of the other folks that you just recently m mentioned? It's very interesting that you bring that up. Um, one, uh, I think one of the Smith children later in their memoir said, Mom was making so much food and we didn't know where it was going. <laughs> we weren't eating it. Yeah. In the case of the Mitchells, Captain Mitchell didn't actually 
marry until well after the Civil War. He was living here with his sister, Agnes. And so Agnes was the one that was cooking and caring for these freedom seekers. And it was she who mostly told the stories to the Mitchell children. Uh -huh. Because Captain Mitchell had also been to the California Gold Rush and the Australian Gold Rush, and he thought those stories were much more interesting yeah, yeah, than yeah, the yeah. Bleeding Kansas uh -huh. stories. So as far as I have found, the Mitchell children mostly got their stories from their aunt. OK. Were there any legacies that they, they uh, inherited and acted out on? Yes, actually. There were four Mitchell children, and the ranch was actually called the Big Four Ranch because they were all so tall. Well, the eldest brother and the youngest brother worked for Hornaday when he founded the New York Zoological Society. It's now called the Bronx Zoo. Wow. And H.R., the eldest, he was a major, he was like the CEO of the place. Okay. And so what I'm getting at is they were very educated, and Maud, the only girl in the family, she was an accomplished artist. She had studied in New York, and she felt it was her role to preserve these stories. She helped get all the story put in the 1930s WPA uh, tourist guide that were published. She helped do the groundwork to get the Beecher Church put on the National Register. That's awesome. Now, we know that Captain Mitchell could have done many other things. But why do you think he took a stand and, and put his life in jeopardy and his sister's life in jeopardy? Well, this is very interesting. In my research, I've found that a lot of these families were radicalized during the Amistad trial in Connecticut in the late 1830s. And we know that Captain Mitchell's father, William Mitchell Sr., was one of the founding members of an anti-slavery society in Middleton, Connecticut. You know, the, the people, during the Amistad trial, it, it was all in the news, and the people right. would come and, and observe the trial. And the former president of the United States was one of the attorneys. It was big news back then. And there was a lot of sympathy for these Africans who wanted to go back to Africa. So I think that's where it came from. And then this opportunity sure, sure. to act on those ideals came up. So he jumped at it, and, and um, he had all these leadership skills from having been through those experiences. Can you imagine coming here in 1856 when as far as you could see, it was just tall grass prairie? There were no trees here, even along Antelope Creek here. And that's where they had to go to harvest logs to build the original log cabin, which is now encased in the rest of the house. When it was first built, it was just a log cabin, about 16 by 12, something like that, yeah. with an upper loft. And then when Mitchell got married, they jacked the house up and dug out a basement and made a stone foundation. And then I think also at that time they added this portion here. Okay. And the front door used to be right here where this window is. And we're really lucky. Kate Buster, who is the great-great-granddaughter, she has authenticated and documented every change That's to awesome. the house. It was in the Mitchell family all the way up until the 70s when the Chryslers bought it. And the fugitive slaves would have been... Hidden in that loft area up there that's now yeah. the window. That was made into Maud Studio in the 1930s, I think, somewhere okay. around there. So the original loft isn't there anymore. And what is so fascinating, the Chryslers have enabled anybody to come by and look through the window right. and see the original logs of the original cabin. I bet there's more out here that people don't know about. I think you may be right. Yeah. You know, we're so fortunate to have the Chryslers living here because they've really embraced the history. Yeah. 
I get inspired every time I come here. It gives me a chance to not think about what I have to do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I'm in the moment. What about you? Oh, I get caught up in all the day-to-day -day activities, but when I have a chance to reflect, yes. I feel like somebody's looking over my shoulder. <laughs> huh. Yeah, me too. Here's their little shrine to the Thomas. pioneers, and here we have Maud Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And in this photo, they're holding an original Beecher Bible, which is the Sharps rifle. And then in this photo, she is holding an original Beecher Bible. It's stamped by Henry Ward Beecher's okay. congregation. And then we have Ethel here. Ethel Morgan, and this little plaque is in, in her memory. She was so beloved. I think this was done in 1907 for the 50th anniversary of the church. And uh, Maud, Captain Mitchell's daughter, was the artist. What a great artist. Of course, here we have the bell. You want to ring the bell? No, you ring it. The, the don't, think don't, that, don't go up with it now. They'll think there's a fire or something. <laughs> The kids love to oh, come do this. Bet. I think the town is used to it. They, oh, there's a tour in town. Yeah. Why do you think they chose Wabunsi? Why not stay in Lawrence or Topeka? We're very fortunate to have the company minutes uh -huh. from the time they left New Haven, Connecticut, until they formed the Wabunsi Town Company. So we know very specifically that they wanted their own place. They didn't want to combine with anybody else. And you had the Potawatomi Reservation mm -hmm. that extended all the way from Topeka to the edge of Mount Mitchell over here. So that land was off limits for settlement. They wanted to be near the river. They were thinking of the future economy of the town. They wanted a river because at that time there was steamboat traffic. Yeah. Well, you know what's strange to me is that a lot of, like, I'm looking at Manhattan, and Manhattan is named for a town back east, Manhattan, New York. And why do you think they didn't name this New Haven after the place where they came from or some other town in Connecticut? That's a good question. And again, going back to the minutes, there, there were a lot of lively discussions about this. They did want to name it. Name it. Some of them wanted to name it New Haven, and there were some heated arguments about it. But Charles Lines, who was the elected leader of the colony, I think he was on business in Lawrence, and there was an old Indian agent that had been around since the late 1830s. And he asked him what would be a good name. And he suggested Wabansa, or Wabansi, mm -hmm. and uh, meaning, and at the time, interpreting it to mean dawn of day. Sure. And there's, if you get into that, it's much more nuanced than dawn of day. But that's what the white people thought it meant. And since they had come from the east and were starting new lives, they thought it was perfect. Sure. Well, this Underground Railroad story is fascinating for so many people. And being able to walk in the footsteps of these folks is amazing to me. I know that there were diverse people involved in the Underground Railroad and in this community. Who are some of the unsung heroes that we haven't heard about? Since it was an illegal activity, uh, people at the time didn't really talk about That's it right. that much, even in, in, among the families. But there was a great wave of nostalgia and, and reflection that started in the 1870s. It really culminated in 1879 at a massive old settlers meeting in Lawrence. And all these subjects came up. We know that Captain Mitchell, since his children perpetuated the stories, we know about them. But then we have people like the, the Platt brothers. Their father was Jura Platt, who was quite well known as an Underground Railroad station master in Minden, Illinois. They were here, and we have a photograph that a black woman had made it to Canada and apparently gotten married, and she sent a photograph back to the Platts. 
And when their descendants gave these objects to the Kansas State Historical Society, this photograph was among those pictures. And from the family stories, she was one of the people that the Platt brothers helped. Then you have somebody like Sam Weed, who was kind of the uncle figure of everybody and, and was known to uh, imbibe occasionally. <laughs> We know that he helped because in one of the few documented trains that came through, they talk about him getting a plow to help them cut down the bank at the river so they could cross the river. Then there's mention that the Lines family, Charles Lines and his family, had fugitive slaves staying with him. The Kelsey family is mentioned. And uh, who knows, with the internet and sure. family diaries, right. uh, He better look out. I want to rest me a while till the war's over anyhow. And if white folks should come after me, well, I mean to fight with them. I'm a free man now. Once an established route like the Lane Trail became well known, it became harder to avoid slave hunters and the law that would have been on the side of slave owners during the territorial period. You have to remember the abolitionists were considered the extremists to many Americans at that time. 
But the people of Wabunsi saw things differently and helped not only Neon Hearts group, but others before and after the last train passed through. What is often missed in the story of slavery in America is that these were refugees, people stolen from their homeland and sold into slavery, and not just by white men. They were treated more as cattle and property rather than as human beings, and yet they persevered. So often we drive past places we think we know and don't stop to think what really went on here. In 1985, I first came to Manhattan, Kansas as a student and was introduced to some of the stories about the Underground Railroad. As I began teaching and working with kids, I've tried to share my love of history with them. To me, history is a current event. Whatever came before us acts upon our lives today. I think examples are the key to anyone's success in growing up. And my mother gave me the best examples I could possibly ever had, which caused me to survive difficult times. And there was this relationship that she had with a diversity of people in our community that let me know that there was another side to the story other than the ones that I heard at school. I was born and raised in Pleasantville, New Jersey. And we have a boardwalk in the town right next door to us, Atlantic City. And we would go to the boardwalk and go swimming, or we would go to the boardwalk. They had three piers, a Million Dollar Pier, a Steeplechase Pier, and a Steel Pier. Well, on the Steel Pier, they had a show where this high-diving horse would do this fantastic feat and go up this ramp and dive off into this pool. It was an amazing experience for a young man like myself. And as we left there, we decided to go to the Wax Museum. And inside this wax museum, we saw kings, queens, um, Hollywood movie stars. It was fascinating because I had never experienced a piece of wax to look like that. And at the very end, something happened. My mom always told us that there's, there's two types of alarm clocks. There's an alarm clock when you need to be on time for school or whatever. And then there's an alarm clock when something special happens, a graduation or birth of a baby. And my alarm clock went off because there was a diorama that pictured a, an African family and they were in loincloth and they had bones in their noses and plates in their lips. And then there was this sign and the sign said, savages. As a youth, I said, these folks look like me. And I, I had a curiosity to know if that was true. Well, my sister couldn't answer it, but my mother did. And she told me that it is true that there are folks in Africa that decorate themselves accordingly. But the reality is not all African people look like that. And in America, she said, not all Americans look the same. Everybody has their own uh, uh, way of dressing and, and beautifying themselves. She said, but the sign, that was a, a, a person's or that museum's way of displaying uh, racial superiority. You have come from more than just slavery, she told me. And it's up to you to figure out your journey. And so from that point on, I, I really wanted to know, did we do anything besides being slaves? And if so, what did we do? And it's an important question to ask today. And that's because African Americans and people in general do not know their own history. Not too far from the town of Wabunsi is the remains of one of the Platt brothers' homesteads, Enoch, Luther, and Jeremiah. 
settled in this area shortly after the New Haven colony arrived. As young men in Illinois, they experienced the struggle of abolitionists by helping their parents hide and transport runaway slaves to the North. Hearing the call for the Free State Movement, they came down to the Kansas Territory to help in the cause. They were farmers, builders, and preachers. Two of them went on to teach at universities here in Kansas, and one eventually helped start a school for freedmen after the Civil War. Not much is known about the slaves they helped here in Wabansi, but we do have clues. Years after the Civil War, the Platts received a few photographs from former slaves, men and women, who we assume they helped along their path north. Looking at these faces with no names, we can only wonder what they experienced and with what gratitude they felt when they finally had their freedom. Perhaps someday we will learn their names, where they lived, and what became of their families. It's estimated that as many as 35 abolitionists are buried in the Wabunsee Cemetery. It's hard not to feel a closeness to the people who lived and died in this small community. Their lives are sacrifice. Their struggle to do the right thing inspire us to keep up the cause and to make things better for the next generation. But it was not just abolitionists who did a great work here. The generations that would follow after them helped build a community where travelers of freed men and women felt safe. Many go unnamed, and many are yet to be discovered. But their lives will carry on. If we pass on their stories, if we make their lives a sacrifice known. To collect all these stories and provide that narrative of what the Underground Railroad is about, that's something that needs to be done. And, and so that we can honor those people that did this great work, sure. this right thing. If they could do it 160 years ago, why not do it today? And, and that's a, a great benefit of this story, the fact that it shows that as human beings, we're capable of doing the right thing. It means a lot to me to know that, that my family was so involved and so dedicated to this. I ask children when they come in, do you know about the Underground Railroad? And I'm finding that most cases in about the third grade during Black History Month, they learn about the Underground Railroad. And a lot of children are very interested in what I have there. But I think it's something that children should be taught. legacy do you think Captain Mitchell left behind for, for us? Do the right thing. Follow you know, the humanity that your ancestors have passed down to you. And, you know, in his case, he was a Christian and followed the precepts of Christianity, to you know, do unto others as they would do unto sure. you. And, he heard all that as a young child in Middletown, Connecticut. How do you see him within yourself? Well, you know, I thought about that. And I must confess, I'm, in my whole involvement with the Mitchells, 
I'm, I have been more inspired by Maud, I guess, because she's more recent. She never married, and she devoted her life to preserving the stories of the pioneers. It's her desire, her passion uh -huh. to, to keep those stories of the pioneers alive. That's really what's inspired me. But of course, Captain Mitchell and Sister Agnes, they were the source of inspiration for Maud. Sure. So it's in a way, it just kind of passes down. I think one of the things that inspires me about all of these folks, Captain Mitchell being the leader, is the fact that sometimes you have to take a stand. Yeah. Like you said earlier. And not always is it going to be popular. It means that you're probably going to alienate some folks. But you know in your heart when something is right and when something is wrong. I see that part of the legacy of all of these people has played out in my own life in a number of different ways. That's what history does for us. It allows us to see that people have done remarkable things, not without big armies, but you know, sometimes with just a few, that escalates. But somebody has to start it. Rusty, it certainly is a, a, a moving, gripping story that you told. And um, the loss of Richard Pitts is certainly a loss for any of us 
who want to understand and appreciate the power of history. Agreed, you bet. Well, it was such a wonderful project to work on and, and certainly Michael played a large part in this uh, as far as helping us with the research, helping us kind of stay on track with the stories we had. Um, I can give you a little more information about just kind of the organization of this process if you want, or if you just want to go to Q&A, we can do whatever you like, Jim. Uh, certainly, uh, go right ahead. Okay. Um, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? So I think, again, giving some kudos here to Michael, a big part about kind of taking off something, I guess kind of taking a bite of history that's this large, was trying to narrow it down to the Wabunsi stories. And Richard, for his part, you know, he was kind of a transplant from New, Jer New Jersey, had been in Manhattan, Kansas, which is about 20 miles down from, uh, down the road from Wabunsee. And he had picked up the interest in this probably some 20 years ago, Michael, maybe 15 years ago. Yeah. So he had been leading tours and bringing students out to Mount Mitchell, to the Mitchell Homestead and other areas for quite some time, giving a narrative of the African-American experience and of, of uh, the black experience. Uh, of what it would have been like to have been perhaps someone traveling this road. And so every time I would come across the new piece of history that we wanted to tie together, I would go to Michael and say, Michael, have you told me about this? And at some point, I think Michael, you got a little upset with me because <laughs> you're like, it won't stay in my head all the time. Cause I'd say now, what did, what did Jerry Platt say to his brother? And he's like, I wasn't there. That was 18 <laughs> something, but, um, but there was just so much uh, history, even locally. And, I remember when this was first coming out, people said, why didn't you focus on uh, Topeka? Or why didn't you focus on Lawrence? And I said, well, there's so much there. We thought, boy, if we're going to do the Western Spur, let's do the furthest Western Loop. And and even with that, when you have the Beecher Bible and Rifle uh, Church there, when you have the, the New Haven, Connecticut colony coming out, that was a lot of big, heavy players in this relatively small part of the country. And so in doing that, that kind of helped with the research because we could – I could order in one journal at a time and read through, you know, 50 pages of Sam Weed talking to uh, the Platt brothers or others and, and just these little anecdotal pieces uh, tying together places. And for me, what was unique is every time I've been up on top of Mount Mitchell, you can look over and kind of point to where there's where the Platt brothers were. Over here is where these other families were. And of course, here's the Mitchells down below. And so as people would describe coming to this little colony and meeting these good people and neighbors, you could visualize it just by standing on top of Mount Mitchell. And so uh, uh, certainly there's lots more history there than what we, we covered five years ago, but it was such a fun and thrilling experience to be part of that. And a personal connection I didn't know I had until we started reading in into the minutes of the uh, Beecher um, church was that I have a, a relative named Sarah Earl. This would be a distant on an uncle's side, but she kept the minutes for almost 30 years. She was like the secretary of the church there. And I came across some maps and I found a little plot of land where she lived um, just south of Womigo. And I have a relative that was, you know, a distant relative that's part of this story. So it's kind of cool when you can find those personal family connections. Most definitely, Rusty. And Michael, you uh, carry a number of titles. Um, but one of them is president of the Prairie Guards. And as the story uh, unfolds here in uh, the film, that's a very important organization and role, not only in the past in Seeking Freedom, but currently today, is it not? It certainly is, Jim. Um, every generation since those first pioneers that came with the Beecher colony and the previous people like the Smiths and the Bisbees, uh, they all made an effort to tell the story and pass it on. Uh, and I felt I and uh, Captain Mitchell's great granddaughter, Kate Buster, and a local school teacher, uh, Carol Cook, we all got together about 20 years ago and, and saw, recognized this story. And this was, you know, internet was early days then and researching online was a new thing, but we quickly learned that you can start making connections 
And that's what we've been doing ever since, tracing down these stories, finding diaries, finding letters. Uh, just, just last night, actually, I, I discovered that um, the Wamiga Library sponsors a database of all the local papers going back to the 1870s and it's searchable by name. And so <laughs> this is what I do in my off time. I just put in a name. Last night it was Sebring because the Sebring's uh, homesteaded right next to Mount Mitchell and there's a ruin from their days that are there. We're, we're in the process of getting Mount Mitchell and the Mitchell farmstead put on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, anyway, so every generation has tried to preserve the story and it's our turn now and Mount Mitchell has become the focus. Uh, it's just got so many things on so many levels as far as education goes. Uh, getting kids out into nature is a rare thing these days and uh, with, with the pandemic, uh, we've seen a threefold increase in visitors to Mount Mitchell. And uh, a lot of it is the recreational side, just getting out of the house. But, you know, when people are there, the signage is there, the stories on the internet, if you want, we're getting an app for our phone. The new Freedom's Frontier app uh, tells our story. So that this is how we're doing it in 2020. Um, we're, we're just, keeping the tradition alive and telling the stories, passing them on. And I think one of the things, Rusty, uh, uh, it's amazing that often we think of history as being so distant and so separate from the lives we lead now, but whether it's accepting the results of an election, how do we keep people from voting twice, um, the, the desires of some people in society to persecute other people in society, all of these questions just keep bubbling back to the sur surface. We don't ever, as Mike, Michael, I think you said, we, we haven't solved these challenges. We've only, uh, moved them down the road a bit. I think, well, it's interesting when you go back, um, on our YouTube channel, sometimes I look at the analytics and see what part of a film was watched the most. And the dialogue between uh, Richard and Michael inside of the Beecher um, Chapel, and they're talking about, you know, what, what's next, what's going to happen. And that conversation to me is one of those, one of those real powerful moments, even when we filmed, I remember being there with Jay, the, the college student filmed that with me. And I think Michael, you said something to the point of, you know, now you believe now is the time we're, we're ready as a country to, to face this issue of, of race and deal with it. And boy, whether, whether people wanted to or not, it has become such a focal point. And I, I will tell you our comments on this and other African-American history documentaries we've done um, has been very lively and uh, interesting to see the different generations of people commenting and, and to a certain, to, I shouldn't say just disagreements, but a certain level of acknowledging things from their past that they wouldn't have ever thought was an issue before. So um, that's what's been, I guess, really inspiring is I know that teachers can not just use this as a history piece, but this is a great dialogue piece about racism and what would cause a group of people um, to break the law and become abolitionists and help. It doesn't mean that they were saviors per se, but they were people that, that got involved for what we would say is the right reason. And you know, Michael, in the film, you use the term radicalize, but <laughs> by today's nature, it'd be like, wow, you know, what, what do bored Christians do when, when they have no time and there's no other date? They, they take off on these wild adventures to go, you know, move across country to help make sure that Kansas became a free state. Um, I loved reading those journals. The, the Platt brothers, when they were young and their father was actively involved, he was a big time abolitionist. And they come in, they were ready. They were ready to, to get to work. So cool stuff. One question um, that was offered up is that uh, on both sides of these issues were people driven by um, almost religious zeal and passion. And we need no 
more look than the last 24 hours, the discussion of how you select a Supreme Court justice, that the same question comes up again. Um, uh, are there any lessons to take from how they dealt with their zeal and passion um, that may help us in the current times? Do you want to start with that, Michael? No, you take it away. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember reading one of these uh, journals, and uh, again, Michael was fabulous. He, he gave me a little hint, and I kind of go off on a detour of research for a month. But one of these, uh, uh, I forget what you called them, Michael, but basically it was like a, a roadmap towards like these big, thick encyclopedia books that here's the history for the last 10 years of Alma, Kansas. And oftentimes they spoke in those times of very glorious, very superfluous words where it was nothing but, but grace and wonder and, you know, God smiled upon them and they could do no wrong other than they were learning from their past. But as they talked about the distinction between, you know, free staters and free soilers and Jayhawkers and, and you know, the, the Missouri ruffians, it, it was a lot like today. You could be the person who says, you know what, I'm just not into politics. I'm just not getting involved. I just want to get my little plot of dirt and build my cabin in the woods and just be away from it all. And then your neighbor's on one side, but instead of putting up big posters and signs, they're at church and they're calling kind of like the rally cry of, we got to do something to help our neighbor. And there were those who were saying, look, I don't own slaves myself, but this is the, this is the way of the South and we want to preserve our way of life. And you guys are going to take it away from us. So whether you wanted to be involved or not, you couldn't out, you couldn't keep the the, the shouting going down. And I, I think the thing that kind of impressed me too was that because these early compacts had been made, you know, the, the men who came over from Connecticut first without their wives and kids to kind of set up kind of the safe area, they made that commitment to Lawrence that they would come and fight if they ever needed them. And I believe Michael, there's the, the story about the battle where they actually, they'd help successfully fight off uh, this, this border, the mini border skirmish that happened. And because of those early commitments, you know, that's what made it, that's what allowed for the Underground Railroad to, to connect. Because it wasn't just like a quarter mile down the road and here's your next drop off zone. You had to go 30 miles, maybe 50 miles from one way station to the next. And so if they had not formed those good connections and been neighborly, they wouldn't have known who to trust or where they could take people. So. Michael, do you have anything to add to those stories? Because I know you are uh, an encyclopedia that walks and talks, uh, just like, <laughs> our, uh, just like our, 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 our magic internet connected phones, you're even better. Well, I must say I'm a bit at a loss for words with what's happening right now in our country. Uh, it's it's reckoning is a, a word that's thrown around a lot these days and uh it, it definitely is a time of reckoning and and I, I it's day by day right now with all the events that are unfolding uh i i just i think of james baldwin and his take on america when he was young and i think he died in the 1980s uh He's one of the most astute voices uh, in American history about, you know, our legacy of slavery and inequality in this country. So I, if anybody wants to really understand what's going on, read, read James Baldwin. It, it, it's all, as Malcolm X said, it, the chickens are coming home to roost. You know, we've swept this under the road, under, under the rug for far too long and thank God the young people are recognizing and responding to, to what's going on. Enough is enough. I mean, the systemic racism in this society, it, it, it's just everywhere you look. And, and thank God some white people are looking and think, well, does this apply to me? Uh, maybe. Um, and I know I, I live in a rural area and, and a lot of it is people grow up without experiencing other cultures and other people with different colored skin or different uh, backgrounds. And it's such an irony because 
this, hello, this was all Indian land at one time. And who came in but immigrants? Um, anyway, I'm rambling. I, I just think uh, we, all the historians that you see as talking heads on the, on the news these days, they're all freaked out. This is a very serious time. And, and to me, it, the things that, the equality that we've been striving for since the constitution was written, we are at a point now, point now where it can go either way. We can go into dictatorship or we can go into a more equal and equitable country. Uh, you, you put the nickel in the slot. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. I, I very much uh, appreciate that, that Michael. And on October 1st, you're going to be uh, sharing uh, more about these individual sites and an additional program uh, about Wabunsee County. And I appreciate you doing that and urge people to go online and register for that program as well. So we do thank you for uh, uh, all that you do to preserve all this history. And uh, I, one final question for you, Rusty. You, you work uh, in education, but you're working with um, people of a relatively young age that are trying to grasp and understand the world that we live in. Um, Are there messages that you think at the end of the day films like this can really help them to understand their world? Yes, I, I think a couple of things come to mind. You know, from the historical side of things, you know, to think that a, a small a small state, a relatively small population, um good people did the right thing. I mean, they, they really, there was, there was opposition in all things, but people really did follow their conscience to do the right thing. And again, I, I try to stress this just because of some of the comments we often see on YouTube, but these were not white saviors coming to like save people here. These were people who acted upon their conscience. And again, maybe didn't fully understand or fully appreciate everything about the people they were helping, but they went to great personal sacrifice to do this. Um, when I read the, the journal by Charles Leonhardt that talks about, and we actually kind of illustrate this map of the men pulling the wagons or walking there. Again, a lot of the language is a little superfluous because again, it was all, you know, we, we, they talk about tornadoes and all these, you know, environmental things fighting against them, but they, they took a two and a half month hiatus from whatever they were doing in life to go on this journey to go three and 330 miles or whatever it was from Lawrence area this weird spur clear out to Manhattan, Kansas, up back north and back up. Uh, and they did this because it was, it was the right thing to do. They'd kind of committed to this. And when people are looking at, at working in a cause, whether that you want to call it social justice or some area that they care about, I think about these young people I've met on campus who may have never thought that they wanted to march in some, something like a Black Lives Matter you know, movement but they're seeing inspiration from people that, that went out and did things. And I think for me personally, there's that whole other conviction too, that you can follow the dictates of your heart to do the right thing. Um, I've known people uh, who have grown up in very racist backgrounds who came with some very bad upbringing. And I'm not putting any claims that this movie did something for them, but they'll see movies like James, like if you saw James Baldwin, I Am Not Your Negro, you know, they're just incredible films that are coming out now. New books are coming out um, that they probably would have never dared to look at. But we now are in a time where they're like, there is kind of this awakening happening within culture to say, maybe I don't know the whole history here. And the positive side is when you look at films like this is there is plenty of plenty of heroes and people who weren't perfect, but they did the right thing. And as Brad Bernheide says in the film, you know, if they could do the right thing 160 years ago, then surely we can do the right thing today. Good words to end on. Very much appreciate the work you've done with this film, Rusty, and the time you uh, shared today to provide additional insight. And of course, Michael, we always appreciate uh, hearing from you and are excited that you're going to have a program here in just a few days that we're gonna be able to share uh, more about the individual 
Wabunsee sites along the way and the work that you're doing to preserve those sites. I want to thank you both for being a part of today's uh, program. Um, as noted, we're celebrating the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom this month uh, at Freedom's Frontier, and we thank you for being a part of today's program as we provided you with this special showing of this film. So thank you for joining us. I hope you have a pleasant rest of your Sunday afternoon. Take care. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.